Hello everyone, welcome to Lukman IAS. Today we are going to have the Hindu newspaper analysis dated 29th of November 2023. In today's newspaper analysis we have uh, like taken for discussion, we are going to cover a mapping topic and we will cover the most important articles from the newspaper. Most of the articles are good from newspaper today. So let us see the list of articles that we are going to discuss. So in all we are going to discuss about 10 articles and one mapping topic today. All right. So let us begin the discussion with the first topic which is a mapping topic. So we are going to discuss about Amazon River Basin. Right. So as we know that Amazon is also known as the lung of the let's say lung of the earth amazon river system is known as the lung of the earth so it's important that like we not only focus on the amazon river system but uh, amazon river systems or amazon forests but we also need to understand what is the total area which is known as river basin means as part of the river so this is the central portion of the river let's say this is the river right but this river also let's say originates from here but this river has some of the tributaries distributaries that are let's say helpful for this uh, like you know river water to reach to wider areas yes. so the overall area to which the river water reaches or expands is known as river basin so generally this is the main course of the river as we can see over here this is the main course of the river right but the thing is this river basin flows through many countries in South America so Amazon River Basin is in South America. Amazon River is in South America. And South America has 12 countries. As we discussed earlier, it has 12 countries and there is one territory which is part of uh, France, right? So out of those 12 countries, majorly the Amazon River Basin is, let's say, confined to the northern portion of South America means like it is confined to the northern portion of South America so how many countries are covered by it all the countries that are there in the northern portion of South America they are covered by Amazon River Basin right so this is just there is just one country which is Suriname it has very less presence of the Amazon River basis, Basin. Apart from this, all other countries has presence of it. As we discussed, there are 12 countries in all in South America. If we exclude, let's say, the southern countries, if we exclude the southern countries over here, for example, number one, Chile, number two, Argentina, number three, Uruguay, number four, Paraguay, right? So eight countries are remaining in the northern part. Out of eight, if we take out the Suriname as a, uh, like, you know, from the river basin so we are left with seven countries so amazon river basin let's say it spans or like you know it 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 it, it, it spans to seven countries in the south america right south america is a continent as we have discussed earlier as well so what are those seven countries we are going to discuss now let's discuss about those seven countries so the thing is one of the major country that is there is brazil okay so now let us number it again Brazil is one of the major country through which most of the Amazon river and its basin flows, right? Apart from this, the other country is Bolivia, the second country. Third country is Peru. Fourth country is Ecuador. Fifth country is Colombia. Sixth country is Venezuela. And seventh country is Guyana. Okay, this is Guyana. Suriname, I mean Amazon river basin, creates a kind of border with Suriname. So Suriname is not included over here. And French Guiana, French Guiana is a territory of France. So that's why, let's say like, you know, in French Guiana also, it does not, let's say, extend to that level. So there are seven countries, Brazil, Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, Venezuela, and Guyana, through which Amazon River and its, let's say like, you know, uh, catchment area, spans right uh, so it, it expands to that thing so this is another map this map showcases the black and white thing i mean like you know in a, a little uh, let's say darkened format so this is the overall catchment area of the amazon river basin this is the thing so having understood this i have also included 
let's say for for your understanding i have included another okay that is not here so i'll, I'll get that particular pdf replaced also the pdf that uh, that i'm going to share it will be having two maps and there will be detailed details also about amazon river basin all right so let us discuss about the first topic this particular topic this topic is important today all right so name of the topic is unpacking the dubai climate meeting okay so we are going to discuss about the climate meeting which is going to have in dubai okay so let's discuss about this topic name of the topic is topic 1 unpacking the dubai climate meeting so this topic is very very important this topic is important from the viewpoint of environment and ecology right it is important for environment and ecology it's important for the prelims exam and it's also important for the mains exam mains exam under GS paper 3 it is important under GS paper 3 of the mains exam so we are going to discuss about this topic in detail good afternoon Vijay Lal thank you so much for joining so unpacking the Dubai climate meeting so why we are uh, the author has named this as Dubai climate meeting because there is a conference of parties COP 28 conference of parties 28 is going to happen this conference of parties uh, is of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. In short, it is known as UNFCCC. So its 28th conference of party is going to be held in Dubai. Okay, it's going to be held in Dubai. And Dubai is a part of United Arab Emirates. And it's going to happen in the month of December 2023. Right, December 2023. So there will be over a week's negotiation between all the member parties of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Yes. So what is this conference of parties? Basically in con uh, the conference of parties happens every year. Every year one conference of party happens and in the conference of parties all the member countries come together to discuss and deliberate upon how to mitigate the climate change. Yes. Right, the main agenda is how to mitigate the climate change, how to address the issues right, that hinder the mitigation efforts of climate change. And as part of the conference of parties, people take different, let's say, like you know, different aims, they adopt goals, and these goals are intended by these member countries to be achieved right through their own actions. So these member countries like India is also a member country most of the member of the United Nations organization is a member of United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change yes, so this is the thing so basically in this conference of party they are going to discuss about few important issues what are the important issues that they are going to discuss about so we are going to talk about this but apart from this okay so we are going to uh, like we are going to talk about this so basically they are going to discuss on two important issues one of the important issue is known as global stock take report okay it is known as global stock take report so what is global stock take report in this article they have mentioned it in short as gst global stock take report right in this article they have mentioned however in india we know gst is an indirect tax this is not the taxation thing is not related to this they have mentioned global stock take report as gst global stock take report like that in short so when we talk about global stock take report what is this report all about right why we are reading about this particular uh, report to understand this particular report we need to understand about paris agreement right we need to understand about paris agreement so what is paris agreement so basically in paris right there was a conference of parties and that has happened in 2015 
right so there was a conference of party that has happened in paris the way that it is happening in dubai now similarly in paris in 2015 there was a conference of parties in that conference of parties all the member countries of the united nations framework convention on climate change they have agreed to few important parameters what are the important parameters that they have agreed number 1 is let's say like reducing the global warming right reducing the impact of global warming reducing the global warming they have agreed that we need to reduce or mitigate the global warming and for reducing the global warming we need to reduce the greenhouse gas emission right we we need to reduce the greenhouse gas emission and so was that a vague target no so they have targeted this thing in a quantitative manner they have quantified the targets so how they have quantified the targets we are going to discuss about it okay they have quantified the target so as part of it they have discuss, they have discussed that in pre industrial level for example in 1850 what was the global average temperature right what was the global average temperature so they have noted about this particular thing that like you know they have uh, noted the global average temperature this is known as pre industrial level so as compared to the pre industrial level these countries have adopted a target that we will not let the global warming right we will not the global temperature rise beyond 1.5 degree centigrade as compared to pre industrial level right so the thing is the tar target was not letting it go beyond 1.5 degree centigrade right by 2100 this was the target right so we will try to reduce it right we will try to limit the increase in temperature rise by this particular temperature 1.5 degree centigrade and if not possible we will try to keep it well below 2 degree centigrade by 2000 by 2100 right and as part of the paris agreement itself these countries have adopted that there will be a global stock take report right there will be a global stock take report they will come up with a global stock take report and this global stock take report will be brought by these member countries every 5th year right every 5th year and as part of the global stock take report what they are going to do they are going to account that what was the target that was achieved by individual members and what is the collective let's say action that these member countries have taken means like has the collective uh, action that the member countries have taken meet the uh, do they meet the paris agreement uh, kind of ambition that they have created so in this article they have mentioned that so far there have been few instances about six instances that we have breached 1.5 degree centigrade uh, thing right you know in this i mean uh, like you know in this cycle from 2015 till now we have already breached it six times so is it possible for these member countries to keep the global warming right below 1.5 degree centigrade as compared to pre industrial level so that's that's a still a debatable issue so now in the upcoming dubai let's say conference of parties that's going to happen they are going to discuss about the global stock take report they are going to release the details related to global stock take report it had had to be released by 2020 by but in 2020 the world was affected by covid 19 in 2021 also like we were recovering and 2022 the global stock take report was not prepared by that time so now they have prepared the global stock take report and they, they are going to deliberate upon it so this is one important aspect that they have discussed in this article and second important aspect that they have discussed in this article is related to the question of fossil fuels what they have discussed the question of fossil fuels so what are fossil fuels as we all know fossil fuels are all those kind of petroleum and gas and natural gas that different countries extract from within let's say like you know by uh, doing oil drilling and all generally the gulf countries are bestowed with the best of the oil reserves in the world so these countries are extracting the fossil fuels 
and they are selling it across the world. Fossil fuels are meeting the energy demands of the world but the thing is like it also comes up with cost. The cost is environmental cost yes. because fossil fuels emit greenhouse gases. They emit greenhouse gases and since they emit greenhouse gases they are responsible for global warming. Okay, they are responsible for global warming. This is another impact, uh, this is another issue. Since this particular summit is going to happen in Dubai and Dubai's main thing, I mean like you know main economic activity is like oil drilling. So they are major oil exporters, right, in the Gulf region, right, in the UAE, among UAE nations. This is one of the major oil exporter. So in the Middle East countries, most of the countries are oil exporters. Since it is going to happen in Dubai and Dubai is sharing this particular thing, United Arab Emirates is sharing this thing. So the thing is like they will not let any kind of fossil fuel phase out thing happen. Means like you know those deliberation may, be, may not be taken well. And there are other countries also who are interested in similar thing. For example, if you talk about Russia. Russia is also exporter of oil. Saudi Arabia is exporter of oil. USA is also a, let's say like energy surplus country. They also export huge amount of their oil reserves to other countries, right? So they have economic interest associated with it. So in this article, they have discussed that it may not be possible in this particular, let's say like, you know, climate summit to discuss about phasing out of fossil fuels. But what is possible? That like you know, coal is one of the resources from where greenhouse gas emission happens. But not only coal should be discussed, but in holistically the author says that holistically it should be discussed there. That was one aspect that they have discussed in this article. Apart from this, they have discussed about adaptation and finance. What? Adaptation and finance as another important measure. So we are going to discuss about what do we mean by adaptation, right, adaptation and finance. Means the global warming is a reality, the global temperature is rising and because global temperature is rising, we are losing huge amount of species. Many of these species are going extinct, right? Many species are going extinct. And since these species are going extinct, so like it, it causes a worry for the planet's, let's say, survival, right? Not only human beings are living in the planet, right? Many other species are also living. So there is loss of species diversity in the world that's happening. Apart from this, many species are not able to adapt to the changing climate. They are not able to adapt to the changing global warming. They are not able to adapt. So the thing is like if species are not able to adapt, can human beings adapt? Since global warming is already happening, so human beings have started finding ways to adapt to it, finding ways to mitigate the global warming. So in the next article, although they have mentioned about this Charles Darwin, yes. but in this article it is worth mentioning what do we mean by adaptation. Charles Darwin has said that those species that are capable of adapting to the changing climate, they are best fit for their survival, right? If they survive more, so they will be able to have their offsprings and like, you know, their lineage will go on. They will be able to adapt. Those species that do not, uh, that are not able to adapt, they will not be able, uh, they will not be suitable for the, let's say, changing climate and they will be wiped out. So it is important that we need to identify the strategies for adaptation. And when we talk about the strategies for adaptation, right, it also relates to like, you know, there are many countries. So uh, like in COP28, they can, uh, there is an opportunity for global goal on adaptation. So in this article, uh, they say that there is a opportunity for adopting a global goal on adaptation right global goal on adaptation there is an opportunity for these countries to let's say go for this global goal on adaptation the second thing they talk about climate finance right they talk about climate finance what do we mean by climate finance it simply means those countries that have already polluted the 
environment those countries that have that have already done their bit in polluting the environment and they have already released greenhouse gases so they are historically responsible for uh, let's say like you know uh, for helping the developing countries to mitigate their climate change risks right so there is a historical responsibility because of which the developed countries should pay to the developing countries this is the thing but the thing is like these uh, like you know these kind of responsibilities are given post facto means like after the incident has already happened because long back right when these developed countries right when they were on their path of development when they were polluting the environment so there there uh, at that time there was no accounting system there was no system to let's say tell these countries that this is the level that you can pollute this is the level that you can release the greenhouse gases so now it is a post facto thing so that's why developed countries do not agree to many of these measures and here the author talks about the revival of loss and damage fund okay the revival of loss and damage fund loss and damage fund so what do we mean by loss and damage fund basically because of climate change huge number of infrastructure losses has happened climate induced let's say hazard climate induced disasters have caused infrastructural loss it has caused let's say like you know loss to the livelihoods of people it has led to the loss of species of different let's say of flora and fauna so the thing is there should be a fund created which is loss and damage fund this particular fund will assist in mitigating those risks in the future means whatever is lost is already lost but the thing is like you know in the future we don't want to loss more species we don't want to have more climate induced hazard so the thing is they have let's say like you know they have thought about creation of a loss and damage fund and how this loss and damage fund will be let's say funded it will be funded collectively by the developed countries but among developed countries there is no unanimity in vision that how much they want to contribute right so in this article they say a top agenda of the global uh, our top agenda is the first global stock uh, stock take report a key part of the paris agreement machinery right so this is the thing this article has been written nicely so this article is very important for gs paper 3 environment and ecology so having understood this now let us move to another article quickly okay this article is also important okay so it says the challenge of a uh, just a minute the challenge of a maritime security in the global south this article is really really good for those people who have political science and international relations as an optional and also it is important for those students who are preparing gs paper 2 because under international relations you need to understand about this particular factor which is what global this, like global south the challenge of maritime security in global south so we are going to discuss about this topic in detail the challenge of maritime security in the global south right we are going to discuss about this topic in detail so to understand this topic let's first understand about the concept of global south okay so when we talk about global south when we talk about global south so global south is a developmental concept what it is a developmental concept global south does not have to do anything right with geographical strictness global south like you know many people may think that for example if this is the earth this is the equator this is the northern hemisphere this is the southern hemisphere so all those countries that are there in the northern hemisphere will be global north all those countries that are in the southern hemisphere will be global south but this is not correct 
So when we talk about global south versus global north debate, it is a developmental concept. Global south means all those countries, it represents all those countries, right, that are developing, right, all those countries that are developing. Now, and if we talk about global north, right, if we talk about global north, so global north I should write somewhere else, right, when we talk about global north, so global north represents all those countries, right, it represents all those countries that are developed countries. Who, like, you know, like what is the parameter that defines a country is developed or developing? It is the country themselves. The countries themselves can, let's say, declare that they are developed or they are developing. It is the countries themselves. If we talk about the World Trade Organization, recently one of the country, I think South Korea, has declared in World Trade Organization that now it is a developed country. And South Korea, I mean like, you know, World Trade Organization simply says that a country that thinks that it is developed, it is developed. It's the thing. But there are like developed countries had certain parameters. What are the parameters? Their human development index is really good. One part. Apart from this, like they have trade surplus with majority of the countries. And the standard of living of their people is good like that. So there are many parameters through which I mean like it is not a flawed concept. It is a let's say like good concept. However, many countries that are developed do not want to be treated as developed countries. They still want to be treated as developing countries because if a country has a tag of developing, in that case, they get some kind of relaxation in some of the measures from World Trade Organization. World Trade Organization is an organization that sets rules for the global trade. All right. So this is the thing. So uh, uh, Vijay Lal has written something. $1,000 per year is kept minimum contribution by the like uh, like 100 billion dollar uh, per year kept minimum contribution by the developed nations which is what not uh, part of the climate finance right so that was the thing that was one of the targets so he is talking about the previous article that we discussed so now we are discussing about so you are saying right means like initially they agreed that they are the developed countries together are going to contribute 100 billion dollars per year for climate mitigation purposes and this amount will be utilized by the developing countries to modify their developmental path so that they go for more climate friendly right you know uh, uh, climate friendly activities for their development now here now we are talking about global north versus global south debate earlier long back during the world war and after world war so there was a connotation of using first world country second world country third world country first world countries were those countries that were developed second world countries were those countries that were developing third world countries were those countries that were underdeveloped so most of the african countries were considered to be third world countries but that nomenclature has shifted with the changing times Right, so geopolitically as of now, there was a person, right, uh, like he is a political theorist, right, so he has coined the term global south versus global north. And nowadays in the present world, we consider global south and global north debate. So now global south represents all the developing countries and India wants to take a lead in the global south development, in the narrative of global south. All right. So India, China, they are emerging countries who are part of global south. So in this article, they say the challenge of maritime security in the global south. So we have understood about global south. So if we talk about India, which is entirely located in northern hemisphere, India is entirely located in where? Northern hemisphere. So even if it is located in northern hemisphere, so it is also still a global south country because it is still developing. Sir, but we consider uh, India, so, so some of the portions lying in the southern hemisphere also. No. Yes, sir. No. Yes, sir. Tell me uh, latitude and longitude exp expense of India. 8 degree to 37 degree like that. 8 degree north like that. Okay, means like it is in the northern hemisphere. India totally lies in northern hemisphere. 
that's the thing china is also a global south means like it represents global south it is located to the north of india like that so it is totally in northern hemisphere so it's a developmental concept okay you can uh, revisit the geography book 10th standard that showcases let's say like you know map of india and all 10th or 6th standard there is ncrt book where it is clearly mentioned right so this is the thing so having understood this now let us understand about maritime security what do we mean by maritime security now when we talk about maritime security so there are two connotation first of all we need to talk it from the perspective of two different kind of nations one those states that are littoral states what those states that are littoral states which states are littoral states those states that have a maritime border okay those states that have a maritime border they are littoral states for example if we talk about india right let me quickly draw the map of india right the southern portion of india has let's say over here we have arabian sea over here we have bay of bengal and it is connected with indian ocean so we peninsular india is uh, shares let's say like maritime border littoral states are all those states that have maritime border or they are island nations okay they have maritime border plus they are themselves island nations and the second type of states that we are going to discuss these are non littoral states non littoral states non littoral states means these are those states that are totally land locked okay these are those states that are land locked but when we talk about land locked states for example uh, like if we talk about afghanistan or maybe like you know some afghanistan or maybe some some countries that are in the middle like you know between other countries they do not have any maritime border the way that india has so do these states not have a concern related to maritime security they also have concern why because global trade happens right in goods global trade in goods generally happens through sea routes more than 90% of the trades that happen it through sea routes it happens through sea routes for the goods so that's why the littoral states and non littoral states they are together concerned about the maritime security when we talk about maritime security we are concerned about all the oceans all the seas through which the ships pass so what are the problems that are arising in the maritime security the problems or issues that are there number one problem is piracy piracy means pirates of caribbean you might have seen like you know they they will dhava bolenge aapke ship mein theek hai it's like that so piracy is there trafficking is there right yes, then smuggling happens right then threats to life to those people who are involved in the trade and all there can be many such problems that are there in let's say like you know in maritime region so all the countries in the world they are up for a rule based international order when we talk about rules based international order we need to understand about united nations convention on the law of the sea which is in short known as unclos this united nations convention on the law of the sea lays down the guidelines lays down the rules of international law right so it it sets the international law related to maritime security it sets that the littoral states like you know to up to what distance right in the sea do they have their territorial sovereignty up to what portion they have let's say uh, control right and they it also mentions about high seas or international water which is not sovereign part of any other country but the thing is like through territorial seas also through contiguous zone there can be trade routes ships that can pass through right so that's why here in this article the authors have discussed about let's say the problems the new threats in the maritime domain there are different kind of emerging threats that are originating time and again 
some of the regions that are widely conflicted is South China Sea, the Indo-Pacific region and all. And in this article, the author have discussed about some important things. We are going to discuss quickly about those things also quickly, right? What is the thing? The author has discussed about some new or creative models. What? They have discussed about creative models to safeguard the maritime region to protect maritime security, to have maritime security. What are those creative models? Number one creative model that India has envisioned. It is known as India's Maritime Vision 2030. It is India's Maritime Vision 2030. India's Maritime Vision 2030. So this is a 10 year maritime vision that India has set in 2020. So India like you know according to its maritime vision India wants to protect in India wants to safeguard the let's say maritime region wherever like India is concerned. And so we have a initiative also which is known as Sagar initiative. Sagar stands for security and growth for all in the region. Okay. Sagar stands for security and growth for all in the region. As part of this initiative, we want to help all other countries that are littoral states in the Indian Ocean region. So we want to, let's say, help them so that we can together protect the maritime security there. So this is Sagar vision. This is also known as security and growth for all in the region. Apart from this, India does have another important thing. Okay. So it is known as India's Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative. Yes. Second is India's Indo-Pacific Ocean Oceans Initiative. Oceans Initiative. So under this particular initiative, India wants to have its own say in the Indo-Pacific region. The United States of America talks about rules-based international order in the Indo-Pacific, uh, uh, let's say, region. China wants to have its hegemonic structure. It, it wants to control most part of the South China Sea, which is a threat to the Indo-Pacific, uh, let's say, oceans initiative and all. So India sees this in this way. And there is a book. This book is written by uh, S. Jay Shankar. Okay, S. Jay Shankar. So he is the external affairs minister in India, the foreign minister of India. So he has written a book. It is known as the India Way. The India Way. And in the eighth chapter of this particular book, he mentions about the Indo-Pacific, like how to protect the Indo-Pacific. Uh, like how India sees Indo-Pacific and all. So this book is really good. It is written by S. Jai Shankarji. So this is good. So the thing is, these are some of the creative models that India has created for itself. There are other creative models that other countries have envisioned. But there are some problems also in these creative, uh, let's say, uh, these creative models. What are those problems? Here the author has mentioned about three problems. Environmentalists highlight three specific anomalies. Number one, lenient regulations that allow for misuse of resources. Means like the regulation that are there in Indo-Pacific region or in maritime security, they are lenient and it allows for what misuse of resources. Number second problem is lacks implementation of the law by security agencies means like you know security agencies are not implementing the law let's say like you know with strength so they are implementing it leniently so that's the second problem third is harmful impact of subsidies that the states offer to incentivize smaller fishermen to shift to motorized trawling so this is related to let's say uh, like you know uh, south maybe like southern portion of India Tamil Nadu. So there are many fishermen in Tamil Nadu. So earlier they were doing fishing activity through boat. But now many of the people have started doing fishing using motorized boats. So they do crawling and while they do crawling they not only do the fishing they also harm the maritime environment. Right, which is harmful for the survival of the uh, species that are there in the maritime region. So in this article they say that like the third issue which is the harmful impact of subsidies that the states offer to incentivize a small fishermen to shift to motorized trawling. So it has harmful impact. So these are the three problems. So finally the author says that now there is no consensus. So to implement 
these strategies right or indian ocean rim uh, like we have indian ocean rim association so to implement them we need to have consensus among the member countries but it seems that member countries do not have consensus among themselves if they have consensus they will be able to come up with strong solid laws they will be let's say like you know implementing the rules in a solid manner but among the member countries there is no consensus which is harming right overall maritime security initiative so finally the author says implementing a collaborative strategy is challenging since it requires maritime agencies to improve interoperability share intelligence and agree on a regional rules based order okay so it also talks about the intelligence agencies and their rule uh, their let's say roles in protecting the maritime domain then we have another topic this topic is again related to the first article that we had discussed here it says time for action cop 28 must compel its signatories to take definitive action once again means like you know this is the same topic that we have discussed earlier over here so here this article is related to conference of parties 28 which is going to happen in dubai right in december month so this is the conference of parties to the united nations framework convention on climate change yes. so here in this article they have uh, talked that like this is the time for action so all the countries they should come together right to take action so that climate mitigation can happen so in this article the author has talked about the paris agreement the paris agreement where the different countries have adopted a target to reduce the global warming so that it is limited below 1.5 degree centigrade as compared to pre-industrial level if not in that case definitely they want to keep it below 2 degree centigrade rise as compared to pre-industrial level by this time so this article is let's say like you know is related to the previous article and here also they have discussed about the global stock take report yes. global stock take report is an accounting of the climate or let's say like you know climate actions that the countries have collectively taken to mitigate the risk of climate change so it is going to be released in the conference of parties now so this is what is mentioned in this article also okay so this article is similar now we have another topic it says a non-starter so basically this topic talks about one important aspect which is all india judicial services yes. so let's quickly discuss about this particular topic topic number three so name of the topic is a non-starter non-starter so this topic is related to indian polity Let's quickly discuss about it. So recently the president of India, the president of India has, let's say, uh, met with the chief justice of India on the uh, constitution day, which is celebrated every 26th of November. Since our constitution was, was adopted, enacted and implemented on 26th of November 1949. Okay. So the thing is the president of India has gave, given a call related to all India judicial services all india judicial services so what do we mean by all india judicial services basically the president of india says that we need to create an all india judicial services wherein like across the country we can conduct examination we can recruit people right for judicial services so these people who are recruited they will be let's say like made the uh, like judges in the district uh, district uh, like you know courts district and sessions courts but like if we talk about what is the present status right in present presently we do not have any all india judicial services presently the high courts in different states what we have high courts in different states they conduct the recruitment process right they conduct the recruitment process to select judges to select judges for sessions. for district and sessions court for district and sessions court sessions courts what do we mean by district and sessions court the same court can be called as a district court and it can be called as a, as a sessions court whenever at the district level the court is let's say looking into the civil matters what 
civil matters, the matters that has to do with inheritance, that has to do with, with some financial, uh, let's say, dispute between parties. So they are, uh, in that case, it, it will be known as district court. Whenever this particular court is looking into criminal matters, right, criminal issues, in that case, it will be known as a sessions court, right? So it depends what, I mean, like on what matter is being heard by the judges there, by the judge there in the districts and sessions court. That's the thing. So generally, in different states, high courts are playing the role of selecting the judges. But President of India has given a call that we should create an All India Judicial Services. It will have inclusivity. It will allow people from diverse backgrounds to join the judiciary. And it's going to, let's say, like, you know, make judiciary more accessible to people because like we are going to have people from marginalized sections of the society so this was a call but in this article the author has said that it is a non-starter it's not going to start why because earlier also similar provision has been uh, uh, earlier also similar provision has been uh, let's say proposed but only two high courts have accepted 13 high courts in india have rejected such proposal earlier Okay, so that has happened. So that's why the author says that uh, uh, the All India Judicial Services is a case which is a non-starter. But here, like you know, there is an article that the author has mentioned. There is an article which is Article 312. So Article 312 in the Constitution of India says that the central government can create a All India Judicial Service. However. Presently, it is under the purview of state governments and state governments do not want to give up their power, right? One more of their, let's say, thing in their domain to the central government. So that's, uh, so that's what is creating problem in legislating this particular thing, okay? So this is all in this article. Now we have another topic. We are going to be quick in this topic. It says, why are the Marathas mobilizing now? We are going to discuss about Marathas issue. So, when we talk about Marathas, Marathas are a community of people who reside in Maharashtra. They reside in Maharashtra. And this article has been written nicely by a professor of sociology. So, there is a sociological viewpoint. A person who has a sociology optional like Chirag, so he will be benefited from this discussion. So let's discuss about this particular topic, okay? So basically in this article, the author has talked about that why Marathas are mobilizing at this point of time, right? Marathas are mobilizing, basically in Maharashtra, Marathas are a, domine, a dominant caste, okay? They are a dominant caste and they are mobilizing for the purpose of getting reservation and reservation where number one they want to get reservation in higher education admission in higher education and number two in government jobs they want to get reservation in government jobs so that's why the marathas are mobilizing but why i mean like why these people are mobilizing now there have been some commissions also that were set up earlier right one of the commission is known as national backward classes commission and there have been three maharashtra state backward class commissions so all these four commissions earlier have rejected the demand of giving reservation to the maharashtra maratha communities in maharashtra so as obc as obc Right, so they have, uh, there was a national backward classes commission, they looked into the issue of whether like you know Maratha should be given reservation. So that has denied, there have been three state commissions also in the state of Maharashtra itself, they have also denied. But what is the crisis for which like you know these people are mobilizing now? So author has talked about, uh, let's say like you know, three type of crisis. Basically two of them are dominant. One of the crisis is known as urban crisis. What is urban crisis? Basically during 1990s, right? At that point of time, 
there were huge number of factories companies where manufacturing activities were dominant prominent so many maratha people like you know who were earlier staying in villages they started mobilizing they started going to urban areas to get jobs and they used to get jobs and from the, their jobs whatever they used to earn some portion of it they used to send back to the villages and in villages their family members were there and in villages they had their dominant position so they were enjoying it well right but the thing is from 1990s till now in 1990s let's say like india has gone for a lpg reform after lpg reform as of now the manufacturing sector is not growing at par with uh, the rate at which like it was growing at 1990s now the manufacturing sector has been overtaken by service sector generally so now the companies right where these people were earlier working earlier these maratha people were working in those companies those companies used to pay high they were giving social security benefits to these people and like you know they could go to schools and also like you know they were maintaining good position but as of now the company structures have changed right in in almost all states in india and now they go for high skill jobs and if we talk about high skill jobs they need let's say more educated people right they need more educated people more skilled people to employ that's the thing that is happening here but now what has happened since these people are not getting more employment uh, let's say in urban private sectors so in rural areas there is a distress means like those people huh. sir one thing sir they have mentioned that now the maratha youth are you know mobilizing towards the informal work such as courier work yes yes earlier they were working in formal works because like you know they needed less skill thing but those formal works are no longer I mean, means like it is there but like you know it is very it has assumed its minimal uh, stature now mm -hmm. means like there are less number of jobs and that's why these maratha people who are coming from rural areas to urban areas they are going for informal sector jobs means like you know they are becoming delivery boys they are becoming i mean like these jobs do not give them social security they do not pay them well also right so the thing is earlier the marathas were enjoying dominance in rural areas in urban areas and now since they are doing these kind of works means like their dominance is at stake right so earlier these people were sending remittances to rural uh, areas but in rural areas now since these people are going for informal job those people who are left they are let's say like forced to do agricultural practice if people want to leave agricultural practice they have to go for those kind of unstructured jobs or informal jobs in urban sector so the thing is their dominance that they were playing in rural areas and in urban areas it has little bit gone down but apart from this in this article the author says let's say like you know gives some data related to education related to many other things if we talk about here the author said that in in maharashtra marathas occupy 37% of open category jobs in government marathas share 15.52% jobs in ias 27.85% jobs in ips and 17.797% in ifs means still they are dominant yes. but not all people are dominant means like you know some portion of maratha people are occupying good good jobs in the state of maharashtra that's the thing and so we have understood the urban crisis we have understood the rural crisis what is the other problem other problem is related to education yes. education so the thing is so like all social groups there has been an increase in aspiration for uh, for higher education among marathas however seats in government institutions have decreased government institution mein jo seats it has gone down and still uh, of the total colleges 64.3% are private unaided and 13.5% are private aided and merely 22% were managed and run by the government so generally if reservation in academics is to be given it is given to government uh, 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 government colleges or private colleges that are aided by the government not in let's say private uh, colleges that are privately funded or managed so there was a committee name of the committee is yashpal committee yashpal committee it noted private institutions charge exorbitant fees and have illegal capitation fees means they take donations at the time of admission so this is also creating problem for the maratha so that's why 
there is a crisis of dominance among the Marathas. They want to dominate now. So that's why they have mobilized again. Okay, this is the thing. So author says that beyond agrarian issues and OBC competition, there is a need to look at the crisis of dominance to understand the current uprising in the state of Maharashtra. So with this, we will move to another article quickly. Very short article we are going to discuss. It says RBI's latest move to increase the risk weights for lending. So this topic is from economy, Indian economy. So we are going to understand this topic quickly. It's not a big topic. We are going to understand, right? It is RBI's latest move to increase risk weights. RBI's latest move to increase risk weights. So let's understand about this topic quickly. So as we all know, RBI is the regulator of banks in India. Reserve Bank of India is the regulator of banking sector in India, of banks and banking sector, I would say. So all scheduled commercial banks, private banks, foreign banks, many non-banking financial companies are regulated by the Reserve Bank of India. So Reserve Bank of India has recently taken a move so that the unstructured loans the loans that are being provided by the non-banking financial companies and scheduled com commercial banks to retail in retail segment, right? So they are unsecured loans. So for these loans, there is no collateral. And since these loans do not bear any collateral, so there is a high risk of these loans, right? So unsecured loans, I, I would write, unsecured loans are at high risk of being, and high risk of being, NPA, right, of being non-performing assets, right? Non-performing assets are those assets, those loans that are extended by the banks to consumers where the banks are not receiving the repayment, where the bank is not receiving the EMI for consecutively three months, right, over 90 days. So they they become NPAs. So these... Hmm? They become stressed assets. So it it has a likelihood of turning to NPS. So the thing is highest amount of risk is associated with unsecured loans. Means like those loans for which collateral is taken by the bank, there is not much risk. For those loans that are, let's say, housing loans and all, it is for the immovable assets. So, like, you know, it is also having very less risk associated with it. So, recently, Reserve Bank of India has said that, like, you know, the Reserve Bank of India has increased the risk weight. Okay. It has increased the risk weight of these, risk weight of these unsecured loans. What do we mean by risk weight? There is something which is known as risk weighted assets. This risk weighted assets is equal to exposure amount into risk weight. Okay, it is equal to exposure amount, right? Into risk weight. So the thing is, Reserve Bank of India has increased the risk weight of unsecured loans by 25 percentage points. It has increased it. So earlier it was 100 percentage, but now it has been increased to 125 percentage. What do we mean by this? Risk weighted asset is equal to whatever amount you are pay, uh, giving to the consumer multiplied by 125 percent. Means like, you know, it has more than 100 percent of risk associated with it. So this is the thing. So if risk weight is increased, means like you are definitely demoted by the RBI to extend more loans in the unsecured category. However, Reserve Bank of India has said that still the non-banking financial companies can give loans, right, to priority sector. Priority se sector lending is there. There they have kept the risk, so risk weight at 100%, like that. Okay. So this is a concept in banking domain. 
so like it's related to economy basically now we have another topic it says the need to disclose political donations the need to disclose political donations they have to do something with what electoral bonds so in india the government of india has enacted electoral bonds scheme in 2018 under which people institutions or non indian residents anyone can donate to political parties by purchasing electoral bonds and sending it to political parties those elect those persons who want to donate to political parties they do not have to disclose their identity their identities will be kept anonymous secure right and so the thing is like political donations can happen so in india let's say there are two major parties one of the party receives the highest amount of political donation which is the ruling party the second party is the congress party right it also re receives around 11% of this thing ha huh? 18% 18 or 11 percent, so what, uh, whatever I remember. So the thing is, now this political donations that are there, political donations has a problem associated with it, because we are dealing with a democracy, right? In democracy, people's vote count. If one party has huge amount of money, it can spend that money to lure the voters. They can even purchase the voters. I mean, like you know, by giving freebies and all. So it's going to, let's say, like you know, meddle the election process altogether. and in this article they have not gone into the legality and other aspects that we have already discussed in this article they have discussed about some other countries where let's say they have similar instrument related to political donations in this article they have discussed about united states of america so as far back is uh, in 1910 the united states of america enacted public funding act which not only made all funding political parties and candidates to be disclosed it also imposed limits on political contributions means in the united states of america they have come up with a act it is known as this public funding act in 1910 means more than 100 years ago 113 years ago from now they have come up with a act where they have allowed that political funding can happen but they have put two restrictions one restriction is they have made a capping that like you know up to this amount political donations can happen second capping was that those people who are donating their identities will be disclosed i mean like it was it was made transparent however in india there are two problems it is not transparent second thing is there is no capping okay the amount of donation can be let's say it it may be as low as 1000 rupees it can go as high as 1 crore rupees per electoral bond okay a person can purchase any number of electoral bond that's the thing so second thing is limit on donations are imposed because unchecked large donation on political parties means like a political parties are given unchecked large donations so it can have problems with the democracy because democracy is something which is let's say considered to be sacrosanct in a democratic country so election should happen in a free and fair manner so that's why they have given these examples that electoral justice ensures that every action procedure and decision related to electoral process is in line with the law and that the the enjoyment of electoral rights are protected yes. okay so this is the thing so basically in this article they have talked about the problems that are associated with the electoral funding that happens in india right in india transparency is lacking second thing is capping is lacking they are the problems then we have another article it says muslim student strength in higher educational education fell by 1.79 lakh in 2020 21 so basically this topic is related to social justice okay it is related to social justice so india is a democracy every citizen of india no matter which caste which religion they belong to all they have equal opportunities all should have equal opportunities like in matters of let's say employment education and all but a survey was conducted name of the survey is unified district information system for education plus and all india higher uh, all india survey of higher education so this survey has identified that the number of people who went to higher education from muslim community so it has dropped in 2022 uh, 2021 to by this amount means like many of these muslim people are not now now they are dropping out of higher education 
okay so why they are dropping out of higher education because of socio-economic problems right they have economic stability they have problems of economic stability at their home and that demands them to join the workforce at the early ages so they drop out of education higher education so a country where less number of people are educated so this country is not going to prosper in the long run because education is the tool through which the middle class people lower middle class people can let's say think of achieving a decent living standard in their life in, uh, in later part of their life so this article talks about this thing so they have mentioned i mean like this is mentioned by one of the professor from national institute of national institute of education planning and administration so this is just a data you can keep this data in mind to let's say like you know back some of the opinion that you may be making then this is another article this article is from science and technology section it is from science and technology section so why this is important because one person from nasa nasa stands for national aeronautics and space administration this is considered to be the top most space uh, organization in the world this nasa is belongs to the united states of america it belongs to usa so national aeronautics and space administrations bill Nen nelson means like he's i think he's the director so he's the administrator of nasa like head of NASA and he has met with, the, with Jitendra Singh. Who is Jitendra Singh? He is the Minister of Science and Technology. So we have mini, uh, Ministry of Science and Technology and he is the Minister of Science and Technology in India. Right? He is not the head of ISRO and all. He is the Minister. So this person has met with Indian Minister of Science and Technology and they have discussed together, right? For a mission to space, right? For a mission to space station. So what do we mean by space station? Let us understand this particular concept. Let's say this is Earth, right? This is Earth. Basically, like presently, there are international space station that lies, right? So international space station that is there presently. So it is there somewhere in the low Earth orbit, where it is in low Earth orbit. This low Earth orbit is located at a distance of 400 kilometer from the surface of the Earth. But low Earth orbit extends up to 200 kilo, or 2,000 km from the surface of the Earth. Up to a distance of 2,000 km, it is considered to be low Earth orbit. After 2,000 km till 36,000 km, it is considered to be medium Earth orbit. Then at 36,786 km, it is, uh, it is known as what? No, it is known as geostationary Earth orbit or geo, geosynchronous Earth orbit like that. So this is the thing. So at this orbit, there is an international space station. This international space station is a collaborative project. It is a collaborative project of various countries. Means here we have USA, United States of America. We have Russia as its member. We have Japan as its member. We have Canada as its member. And we have France as its member, like that. So it's a collaborative project that, that is there. Presently, the present International Space Station. India is also no. no. So what is the purpose of International Space Station? The purpose of International Space Station is that here they send astronauts and these astronauts conduct microgravity experiments, right? They conduct microgravity experiments and after some time they come back also. So this is how, I mean like International Space Station is managed. However, India plans to have its own International Space Station. Like we want to create an International Space Station of our own. So this person has visited India to discuss about the way forward, how we can create and all. So this is the thing. I mean like this is just a visit from the administrator of a topmost, let's say, space agency in the world. Last article. So I'll be taking hardly one or two minutes. SEBI said to plan easing rules governing mutual funds, passive funds. SEBI is Securities and Exchange Board of India. This is the regulator for the primary and secondary market in India. So this regulator keeps on making laws, right, rules to regulate the secondary market in India. So they have recently decided, SEBI has recently decided to ease the norms, to relax the rules, right, 
of mutual fund houses those houses that let's say sell mutual fund instruments to the customers so especially they have thought of relaxing the rules for those mutual fund houses that are dealing with passive funds there are some kind of funds that are known as active funds and passive funds passive funds generally track some kind of index for example if we have nifty 50 some mutual fund can be created that tracks the nifty 50 companies they only invest in nifty 50 companies so it is a kind of passive fund so for passive fund houses the sebi has thought of relaxing the rules and if people want to create mutual fund houses for passive funds earlier they needed to deposit 500 million rupees 1 million is equal to 10 lakh rupees but now they have relaxed it to 100 million okay they have relaxed other norms also for them right so this is the thing only passive funds will be needed to declare that they are following the index every six months rather than every two weeks earlier they had to declare that they are following the passive funds every two weeks but now it has been relaxed means like you know they have to do it every six months so this is the thing this is all in this article means like you can go through it in your free time so that's all from my side for the day thank you so much everyone for attending today's session i hope you have a good day ahead thank you